bio. <laughs> Thank you, Zoo, Sorry for that. letting us know that. Um, <laughs> so for those of you who haven't read his bio, Colin is an independent game audio engineer with a background in interactive sound design. Alongside working on games, Colin also consults for and teaches game audio implementation through programs such as FMOD mm -hmm. and Unity? Okay, I'm saying it right. Great. Um, but yeah, without further ado, I will let you take it away, Colin. Thank you, Erica. Hey, everyone. Um, welcome to my talk. It's called The Interactive Audio Pipeline, What It Takes to Get Sounds into a Video Game. Let me share my screen really quick. If I could say something really quickly, Colin. Is that okay? Absolutely. All right. So uh, to all the attendees, I don't know if you saw Tyler's Slack announcement yet, but if you haven't, I'd recommend you check it out. But basically, um, to increase participation in these workshops, we basically organized a raffle. So asking a question earns you two tickets in a way, just so everyone's more engaged and, I don't know, learning more. So if you want to, then go ahead. Um, you can also ask questions because just be just because you're curious. So, um, and also please don't forget to do the Zoom post survey um, thing that comes up in your browser after this webinar is over because then it'll let us see who actually participated or not. Thank you, Colin, take it away. Sorry about that. Cool, no, no worries at all. And yeah, if anyone has any questions throughout, uh, feel free to type them into the Q&A or ask them in chat. I don't know if there's a chat that's available, but um, Erica will be going through that and kind of forward the, forwarding them as they come up. Um, I'd be happy to answer them between slides, or if we want to wait till the end, uh, I can talk talk over the questions then. Uh, but yeah, this is my talk. Um, we're basically going to be going over um, the game audio pipeline, and by by that, what I mean is essentially the entirety of kind of at a, at a high level at least what it takes to get sounds into a video game um, all the different disciplines that are involved in that maybe not all of them but like all of the common ones some of the less common ones and when in the development cycle they participate um, to start out though we kind of have to talk about games i don't know if any of you are familiar with games um, feel free to to type in if you have any familiar familiarity with them, uh, if you have any familiarity with like film or radio or music production, that has some relevance here as well. But basically, games contrast every other form of media in that they are interactive. Um, and what this means for audio is we can't really predict linearly, like based on a timeline, where sounds need to fall. So we have to. We have to place everything based around events, things that are happening in game. So like in reaction to something happening in a game, as opposed to say in film, we just say like at three minutes and 14 seconds, we need to play a footstep. Um, in games, we say when the player's collider touches the ground or when we reach this particular frame in an animation, then we play the footstep. Um, additionally, in games, we don't know what's going to happen next. So in film or in music, we transition from like one feeling to another feeling or from one space to a different space. For like outdoor to indoor, we might transition from like playing a forest ambience in the background in a film to then playing like a tea kettle on a stove. Whereas in games, we kind of need to be able to accommodate for those transitions smoothly between any number of possibilities of things that can happen. So that creates a degree of complexity that's fairly unique to the medium. And the kind of final piece is games don't always have a fixed perspective. And the way that sounds attenuate um, over different distances, the way this, that they get louder or quieter, the way that the like reverb, the reflections, the kind of echo, if you would, of the sounds changes based on how far away you are from them is pretty drastic and pretty important towards telling our ears where we are within a world. 
And so, yeah, between those three things, we're basically, we, we have a bunch of interesting problems that occur that branch out to almost all of the disciplines. So the first kind of piece of the solution towards this is we have to make all our sounds in games really granular. So for instance, um, we can't have just like a loop of footsteps or I shouldn't say a loop. We, we can't have just like a long recording of footsteps um, because the, the moment a player starts like running faster or like stutters a step that kind of breaks the loop or breaks the sequence and we need to accommodate for that. If they take like a shorter step because we have some procedural animation or something, we need to accommodate for those sorts of changes. Additionally, we may not know what the character is wearing. So maybe we need different clothes sounds. Um, in film, you'll often have what's known as Foley recording, which I'll get into a little bit later, but it's recording performance live to film. And then you go in and edit it later. But basically you have performers who are like pretending to be the sounds of the characters as they're happening and then that's being recorded. Um, so you get these files that have both like the footsteps and the clothing sounds and whatever else in them. And it's, it's kind of all blended together. But if we had a game where you had say five different materials you could walk on, like concrete, grass, tile, whatever else, wood, and then five different outfits you could equip that all sounded different. If we were to record each one of those individually, we'd end up with a multiplicative problem. We'd end up with 25 different kind of walk cycle recordings that we'd need to choose between. Um, whereas if we made that more granular and split the footsteps up from the uh, clothing movement sounds, suddenly we only need 10 different recordings, five of each that we can go between. So that's kind of what I mean in part by sounds need to be granular. But kind of as I touched upon earlier, um, Animations also are often interruptible in games, and we we make a lot of sounds for animations. So for example, I have this clip here. We've got this hammer swinging. There is no sound here, but we, we have this hammer swinging and each, the, the hammer has its own like swing sound. Um, but if you pay really close attention, you can kind of notice that depending on how many things we hit, the hammer spins at a different speed. Um, the the sound almost gets interrupted, or the the animation gets interrupted or delayed based on how many things it's hitting. And so challenges like that appear all over the place, where like the timing for sounds changes. So, for instance, if we were to take this animation and match a sound to like the empty swing, and then play that back in every instance. Um, if we were hitting a bunch of enemies on screen, it would delay this, delay the animation enough that the sound would end way before the, uh, hammer swing in some cases. So our solution for this, this is a project that I worked on was basically to split the swing up into parts of the arc. So we had three or four different kind of partial swing sounds that blended into each other so that if it was interrupted partway through, it would sync up at the next, say, like half turn or something. And we would be able to extend more reasonably and reliably through multiple different kind of timings of the swing arc pattern. Um, additional things that must be granular, music. Music is a big one. We don't know when a jump scare is going to happen and we need to suddenly play a stinger. So we need to kind of break that out and have it be its own event, but we also need that to like play nicely with the rest of the things that can be happening in music. Uh, we don't know when we're gonna have to transition between areas. I mean, there are a bunch of different scenarios. And then my favorite in terms of granularity for talking about this is vehicles, cars in particular. A lot of the like more simulation-based car games like the Forza series, um, there are all sorts of levels of granularity going on there because not only do they need multiple recordings for like different speeds, but they need engine onload versus offload. That means accelerating versus decelerating essentially. Um, they need different kind of variations of sounds for going uphill versus going downhill. They need different road sounds, 
sounds for if you're turning versus braking. And then you extend that out to also the sounds of like the body of the vehicle itself rattling around or not in some cases. Um, but yeah, tons of granularity is needed for audio design. And secondarily, audio must be dynamic. And we touched on this a little bit, but essentially audio needs to be able to transition smoothly between different states. Um, you could think about this as different regions in a game. Um, say we have music for two different zones in a game. We need to be able to smoothly transition between that music and needs to be able to sort of quantize to the beat. So like we don't get a sudden change in tempo as we jump between zones. Um, we need music to transition such that it's not like restarting the track over and over. If we jump back and forth, it kind of smoothly feels like it's transitioning and it's consistent. Um, same thing applies to sound effects, ambience, et cetera. A, an example of this that I really love is from Frostpunk. And this is a kind of city builder survival game. But in Frostpunk, there are a bunch of dynamic positional sounds, such as like drills that you have in the game or like the townspeople that you have that are walking around and gathering in like the town square. And it all transitions smoothly as you zoom in and out from the city. And you're, it's a city manager, so you're doing this a lot. Um, but the other thing that happens is when you zoom really far out in the game, the sounds of kind of this icy wasteland, the ambiences, the howling wind uh, kind of takes over the acoustic mix. So all you end up hearing is heavy, heavy wind sounds um, from really far away and maybe some very distant, louder sounds from your, your town or city. Whereas when you zoom in, that all dampens way down and you feel like you're almost in the town itself. So that's a really neat effect, but that's again, sort of a required, it's, it's, it's a good example of what I mean by games, game sound must be dynamic. Really quick before we move on, are there any questions so far? And if you guys have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and I can give you guys the ability to speak or you can put it in the Q&A. So up to you guys. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll be taking a few more pauses for sure before this is over. So yeah, take your time with those. Um, we can come to them at the end too, if you want. But yeah, with the sort of really verbose <laughs> uh, dive into, I guess, why games, why and how games need to be, um, let's see a question. I'm, I'm actually going to get yeah, to this really quick. One. What is the okay. trickiest transition I've worked on? Actually, that, that swing I was talking about earlier, uh, that was not, it's not exactly a transition. It's much of a like kind of mi more minute microscopic adjustment thing, but that was a really tricky thing to solve partly because the thing that I did the first time to try and solve it didn't work very well from an artistic standpoint, which was I tried to adjust the, the pitch of the swing based on the game time, which technically worked because so if you pitch something down one octave, the file will play back at half speed. That's just kind of how audio works. Uh, that's a different talk. It's digital signal processing, but um, so I tried to basically pitch it down based on the, the game time and it synced up, but it sounded really jarring because the sound of the swing was suddenly like wildly shifting time because it would dip down and pitch every single time you contacted with an enemy. Um, so breaking it into that more granular, those more granular bits was the better solution that I ended up stumbling on, but that was, that was a harder thing to run into and kind of solve. How do like first person gun games and overall shooters work? Do you shoot real guns to acquire the audio? That depends. Um, in many cases, yes. And there are also games that don't have guns in them at all that use the sounds of guns or parts of the sounds of guns for sound effects. Um, sound design is a weird mix between realism and I'll get into this a little bit later, or at least I'll talk about sound design more a little bit later, but sound design is a mix of 
trying to simulate reality and trying to invent something that sounds even more convincing in a way than reality. Um, if you've ever heard a gun in real life, the the sound is a little bit overwhelming if you've like seen a lot of Hollywood films. There, it's like it's loud, but it's not booming and like jarring. But if you fired a gun, you feel that like kickback into your shoulder and into your chest. And I think that feeling is what a lot of sound designers are trying to replicate with gun sounds. Um, so that's why they make them feel kind of like larger than life, larger than reality. Uh, that said, you can totally make gun sounds from not guns. I have done this. I haven't worked on a ton of games that wanted guns or a ton of projects that wanted gun sounds, but you can totally kind of like fake it. Um, I captured the sounds of like the mechanics of a gun from reloading using a door handle just by like playing with the way the mechanics of the door handle worked. So that's that's a fun little example. All right, so what are the tasks in game audio? So we mentioned sound design is one, but put together a little kind of list of where in production these, what the different tasks are that are common and where in production they often fall. Um, we'll run through these one at a time really quick, but then we'll move on to talking about them individually. So I split this up into pre-production and production. Sometimes these phases are like, more interlinked and more kind of fluid, but the, and again, sometimes these positions as well, where they fall in pre-production and production is pretty fluid. But at the start, we basically always have some sort of an audio design direction that needs settling on. That's what, what the palette of our game is going to be and so forth. Then often there'll be a period of collecting a bunch of audio recordings. Um, music composition will happen at some point. Sound design will happen generally through the majority of the project. If we're doing anything with vocal talent, uh, auditioning will happen generally earlier on. Audio systems design, if we need any audio systems design. Same with audio tools design. Um, implementation, that's just the process of putting audio into the game engine itself. Um, music recording, separate from the composition, sometimes. Dialogue recording, if we have any, and then at some point, a marketing push will happen. And so a bunch of marketing materials will need to be put together. So let's talk about that kind of one at a time in a little more depth. So audio design direction is kind of the first thing that needs to be settled on in any project. And I, I say settled on in quotes because everything in a game is kind of a shifting target. Um, the, the idea of what the game is going to be can shift drastically over the course of development, just depending on a number of factors. Maybe some technical limitations come up, maybe um, some testing happens early on in the game and people decide that something just isn't fun. And so the entire development shifts from there. Maybe the art aesthetic shifts like earlier on. Hopefully not later on because it gets like the later in development, these things shift generally the more work gets thrown away and that's always hard to deal with. But the audio design direction is usually settled on by an audio director. If there is one larger studios almost ha always have an audio director, smaller ones may not. Um, sometimes the audio director will have multiple roles. Um, it just depends on team size and need, but an audio director is essentially the person that oversees the audio aesthetic and the, in some cases, the technical needs of the audio team as well, and just make sure makes sure that everything happens. They're sometimes a content creator, but often they are more of a producer type person, um, doing a lot of management and kind of keeping the vision in sight and everybody on the same page. Um, Again, the finding the audio design direction is really just about nailing the aesthetic that you want the game to follow. And it's often in service of the other departments. So when the audio direction is being decided on, it will generally be in similar kind of meetings as the figuring out what the core kind of art aesthetic is. So 
they'll be talking with like the writers and the art leads as well as the technical leads and just like the creative design lead if that is somebody who's on a team often it is um so all of the departments are kind of talking at the start to figure out what the game's going to be and this is where the audio direction gets at least initially sort of settled so following that one of the things that's super important for some studios and less important for others is the collection of raw source recordings and what i mean by this is essentially just lots of audio files that meet the aesthetic estimation of needs for a project. So if we are making, I don't know, a dark kind of spooky carnival game with a lot of kind of old interiors, we might go find some caves and record a bunch of sounds in caves to start out. And we might also try to like meet up for like meet up at a theme park during after hours and see if we can record stuff then. Um, those sort of things are not super uncommon. They're difficult to organize, but like that's that's sort of part of this. But the idea is to create a, a palette of sounds to work from that can help make a project feel unique. And some studios lean really heavily into this. Some studios barely do any of this at all. So the alternative, the main alternative is there are a bunch of really, really great kind of uh, audio sound effects libraries out there that you can just purchase and license. And a lot of studios will lean into this because recording and editing your own sounds does take a ton of time and it's hard. It's, it's very difficult to get sounds that are good to work with. Um, many studios will do some kind of in-studio recording. So this photo on the right here is an example of a Foley studio. Specifically, it's the University of Silicon Valley Foley studio. But basically what this is, is a giant studio where people go to record whatever sounds they need for film. Um, games do similar things. It might look a little different. It might be a little more kind of jury-rigged to the needs of the game and the team. But uh, oftentimes there will be a lot of like in-studio recordings for very isolated sound effects to be the basis of different things. And so you might see a facility like this set up in a studio or in somebody's garage or something for doing the, those types of recordings. Um, recording is, again, generally the bulk of it is done up front in a project and then kind of as needed and as time permits, uh, people will go in and record additional things that are needed. Um, but yeah, this bottom left recording is, or bottom left photo is the field recordist Chris Watson, I believe, um, just recording some wave sounds. Um, field recording is its own sort of profession. So if a, if a studio needs a lot of field recording done, they may actually outsource field recording to somebody like Chris Watson to collect things that are more difficult for uh, people who don't have like multiple weeks on end to go record, to capture. So remote location sounds, those sorts of things. So moving on, um, music composition. So not to be confused with music production, music composition is essentially the process of writing the music that a game needs itself. So with digital music, electronic music and so forth, there's more kind of a gray, more of a gray area blend here between, um, I guess between the composition phase and the production phase. Um, there's, there's a lot more of a back and forth, but for like big symphonic scores and things like the Destiny soundtrack and uh, a lot of the AAA kind of symphonic soundtracks, you'll generally have your composers earlier on in the project working on a lot of the kind of core character melodies and big themes and things. And they're just writing them down and using temporary software instruments to play those. And then later on, they go and record them with like actual live instruments or double the parts with that. Um, when composition can happen during a project, it will like does vary pretty wi widely. Um, in many cases, composition will happen earlier on or start happening earlier on. But in some cases, especially on smaller projects, uh, music doesn't always show up until later in development. Um, and sometimes 
you sometimes a, a team will get all the music they need in a few weeks or a few months. Oftentimes, people will be writing music up until like the last few weeks. Um, oh yeah, big part here is now that we're starting to get into content creation, like things like music, the unique demands of games needs to be need to be taken into consideration. So unlike film, where you kind of you write a piece, maybe adjust it a little bit depending on the timing of the film, but for the most part, the film is cut to the timing of the piece of music. Um, I could be wrong about that, but that's that's what I have heard. Um, so you, you're writing a linear piece and you're trying to match a certain feeling and a certain kind of cadence, and then you place that on your film reel and then you cut the film to kind of match the music or vice versa. In games, we do that a little bit with like cinematics and so forth, but for actual in-game music, it's built off of, for the most part, loops and stingers and transitions. So loops are just chunks of music that can loop. And sometimes we'll layer together like different variations of a loop or different like little pieces of instrument instrumentation in music. So like maybe you have some horns in the background that'll only play if you're like a certain character is present on screen and otherwise it's just a percussion layer or something. Um, but maybe you have like a 16 bar loop of that and then if a certain event happens, now we transition to like a B section in the music, just a different kind of looping chunk. Um, maybe something happens, like a sudden event happens and we need to play like a little musical flourish for a second and then go back to a sort of uh, looping musical section. So the way that game music has to be written is pretty different from what we're used to with like linear film and Again, just general song structure stuff. It's a lot more granular. It's 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 um pretty tricky to write, and there are a bunch of different approaches that people have. Some folks really like to write from a kind of looping idea or kind of headspace where they're they're considering the technical things immediately as they're writing. Other folks will like to make kind of a more linear, traditionally structured piece and then try to take that apart and find the looping sections and the transitions in there and evolve that into their idea. So yeah, a bunch of different ways that music composition can be done for games, but overall it's uh, the kind of uniqueness of the medium demands a pretty specific end result. So once you have your music written out, um, there's a step that's music recording. And if you're, again, doing electronic type music or you know doing a lot of your own solo stuff, this step might be mixed in with your composition. But if you're organizing larger orchestrations using a full orchestra or choirs or whatever else, this the music recording kind of sessions are their own huge deal. Um, recording is expensive because you're essentially bringing on like sometimes upwards of like 80 or 100 people a full, or full orchestra, oftentimes less, but still a lot of people to work on the hour on the clock. And these are professionals in their field. So um, time, time is money and they're very good and they're very rare. <laughs> um, so to combat this, there are, or to work with this, I guess, uh, there are a lot of studios that have their own recording teams that game devs will go to. So here in here near Seattle, Bastyr Chapel is one of the big places that people will go to record things. Um, they have a phenomenal team of recordists. Uh, they're, is recordist the term? Recordist might not be the term, but basically they have a team there that will kind of treat the space so that it has a certain feel to it that is requested by a project. And then they will, um, set up all the microphones and the positions that are needed for whatever they're recording. And then during the actual session itself to be as efficient as possible and as like useful for the studio that's gonna end up having to work with these audio files, they have somebody who goes through and tracks the, uh, the recording session and like marks it up and puts little tags in places to say like, oh, this take was good. This take was good up until here. Um, this is where we started recording this other piece things like that 
can make it as easier, easy for, for whoever has to edit to go through and kind of clean up the recording and I guess transition it or translate it into, again, those like looping pieces and the transitions and things that games need to essentially function. Um, recording, again, because it's uh, so, it's such a logistical hassle, I guess. It's often done in chunks, in larger chunks, um, throughout development cycle and towards the end, but generally not at the very end because a little bit of time is often needed just to implement the, the music itself, get it into the game. Um, yeah, I think, I think that pretty much covers recording. Another thing that's needed, vocal talent. If you have any dialogue in your game, you're gonna need somebody to narrate that dialogue, just to kind of act, act those conversations. If you have any singers for your music, this is part of that step. So especially with the, um, the voice acting world, voice actors are generally not associated with game studios. Um, the voice acting world is largely based around voice acting unions, uh, not entirely, but in the US, it's largely based around voice acting unions. And there are organizations, there are groups out there uh, that essentially talent agencies that a lot of people will go through, a lot of studios will go through to find, um, find and audition voice actors for particular roles. So the studio itself the game dev studio will often go through one of these groups to initially find their voice actors and their vocal talents. And then uh, once they've auditioned and once they've received a few people who are interested in the role, they'll go through those auditions and decide who fits best. Um, generally on a good production cycle, the vocal talent auditioning will happen pretty early on in the dev cycle. So there's a lot of room to record and adjust, which brings us on to dialogue recording. Um, so again, this is outsourced often in a similar way to uh, how the music recording is outsourced. But sometimes, because it's a little less of a logistical problem, uh, sometimes this will be done in a studio itself. Generally, dev teams like to keep the um, recording spaces to a pretty small handful so that they can keep the sounds of those spaces as close together. Um, Cause at the end of the day, they will need to be adjusting all of the sounds and mixing all of the sounds that they get from all the different um, vocal performers to sound like they're in kind of a similar space. And if you're re taking recordings from all over from wherever uh, that, that gets really difficult really quickly because somebody might record in a space that's like, really dead, there's not a lot of reverb and acoustic sound of the room. And somebody might record from a more live room that's got, I don't know, a little, little more reflection. And when you have those side by side in game, it's really easy to tell that something's off. Um, however, the quarantine and the pandemics changed a lot of that. Um, I've heard there's some really interesting kind of problems that have needed solving in that space. Um, but also a lot of a lot of vocal performers now will have their own kind of from home, just from necessity, uh, recording studios or little recording booths. So over the course of the pandemic, that actually became an easier problem to solve just because many of them focused a lot on that because it did help facilitate their work process quite a bit. Um, but the, the gist of how dialogue recording works in games is uh, somebody will write up a bunch of dialogue that needs recording. They'll provide a bunch of context for it, and then they'll send it in to whoever's going to do the recording. Oftentimes the vocal talent will have a coach of some sort, and this coach will help translate the idea along with whoever the audio person is there, usually the director or the vocal director, maybe if there is one dialogue director, um, to the performer 
while still trying to allow them the freedom to perform the role because it is effectively an acting role. Um, and they'll they'll have they'll generally run a few hours of this session. Depends on what they're doing, how strenuous it is, but they'll generally run for a few hours, get a few hundred lines recorded, and then somebody will be tracking this just like with the other stuff, writing down what each line is. And then those lines will be edited and kind of chopped up and labeled and sent off for implementation. And you kind of rinse and repeat that process throughout development cycle until you're done recording, which often is very close to shipping dates <laughs> because um, writing can change in games pretty late. And every time writing changes, new recordings need to happen. So sound design is a big task in games. Everything needs to make sounds. Um, sometimes you barely notice the sounds, things like little UI blips and uh, maybe a little bit of rumble on a screen shake, something like that, just little effects. Sometimes they're really in your face, like the sound of a shotgun going off or a thunderstorm or something. Um, you've got everything from those sort of spot effects to, again, UI sounds. You've got ambient beds. Those are often made up of different layers of things. Um, sometimes you have reactive elements. Sometimes you just have loops. But the idea with sound design is it's, it's generally built up, built up on looping sounds and one-shot sounds. And what a one-shot sound is, is it's a sound that's fired a single time, and then it is sort of forgotten about after it's been fired. A, a looping sound is a sound that can loop endlessly, and you hopefully don't notice where that kind of seam in the sound is where it's looping back to the start. And those are those essentially the building blocks of sound design for games. Um, sound designers usually handle the sound design. Sometimes they'll also handle the implementation of the sounds. Um, in larger studios, often implementation is handled by an individual, but in smaller studios, or a separate individual, but in smaller studios, the sound designers generally will also do their own implementation. And if not them, then a programmer will. Um, so the workflow for sound design is essentially, we gather all that raw source that we got at the start and we, we, we based on our art direction and what we're working on, we take the source that we think is gonna work for that. We cut it to the kind of feeling, the rough feeling that we want and then we layer that with other elements to try to create a new and interesting sound that matches the feeling we're after. Um, sometimes we'll bypass some of those steps by using synthesis. Depends on the aesthetic we're going after. Um, synthesis is essentially just doing a bunch of math behind the scenes. Uh, the sound designer is not actually doing the math. They're using tools to kind of facilitate this, synthesizers and things but turning math into a digital signal that produces a sound that is generally more kind of unnatural feeling, but often that's, an, that's, often that's like an aesthetic that is interesting for some projects. Um, a lot of, I guess, sci-fi and uh, what are, sci-fi and like neon aesthetic games tend to have this a lot. Um, a lot of older retro games are entirely synthesis. So there's there's a there's a spectrum there. And then some games will mix the two a lot. I think League of Legends mixes a lot of synthesis with a lot of natural sounds. Um, just as an example. But so the sound designer will kind of craft these sounds, apply a bunch of effects to them to get them where they want, and then they'll create a few different versions of them often. Not always, but often, especially if it's in a sound, a sound that's going to occur multiple times. Um, and then they'll import this into a piece of software or maybe into the game engine directly. And either them or somebody else will handle the logic to, to, to determine how the sound will play within the sound the, within the game itself. Um, sound design generally happens either until the budget runs out for it or until the end of a, de uh, a game dev cycle. Um, there's basically always something to improve when it comes to sound design. And then once you have the sounds in 
or like ready to be placed in the game, you move on to the audio implementation step. Um, this is what I do a lot of kind of primarily. I'll also do some audio systems and tools design, but basically what audio implementation is, is it's the task of taking sound effects and applying game logic to them so that when the sound is played or started, it behaves how you would want it to or how you would expect it to. So sometimes what this can look like is play an event for the player character's walk cycle. And then under that, we kind of play a random footstep based on a material. Which material we choose is being told to us by the game engine. And then we play a random clothing sound based on what we're wearing, which is also told to us by the game engine. So the implementer not only kind of creates that internal logic for what's going to play and when it's going to play, but also creates those hooks, or sometimes creates those hooks, or at least attaches the sound event to those hooks for what material we're standing on and what we're wearing, as an example. Um, other common ones are like day-night cycles. So like what time of day it is, what what creature and ambient sounds should we play depending on what time of day it is? Or again, back to the car example, how fast are we going? Are we going uphill or downhill? So those sorts of things are kind of the feed back and forth between the audio implementation and the game engine. Um, this image on the upper right here is a piece of software known as WISE. It's spelled W-WISE, um, W-W-I-S-E. It's the AAA standard for audio implementation in most places. Um, on this previous slide, this bottom right one is FMOD, which is another kind of more standard audio implementation piece of software, generally used on smaller teams. Um, a lot of racing games also like it just because of the way that it handles um, its, I guess, data parameter controls. Um, implementation is another thing that basically sometimes it'll happen in chunks towards the end of the project, but oftentimes it'll happen throughout the entire project because implementation is necessary for sound designers to iterate on their work. Um, because the sound, you can't really tell what you've made in game sounds very well until you hear them in the context of the game itself. And sound design relies on implementation for that step. So audio systems design. Having a dedicated audio systems designer is a pretty rare thing in games. Um, larger studios will often have one or two, but smaller and even some medium-sized studios generally won't have any. If they need any audio engineering done, they either got lucky with their sound designer and their designer has some experience in this, or they have a programmer try and figure out what to do with this. Um, but the idea behind audio systems design is it's the process of creating systems and often, oftentimes creating actual like game engine level architecture to facilitate specific um, needs for a game. So for instance, if we're playing a first person shooter, one of the most common things that's sought after from an audio systems perspective is the ability to handle what's called obstruction and occlusion. Um, additionally, audio propagation. And what those are, are basically figuring out ways to estimate what a sound sh should sound like if it's behind an object. Um, so if you have a sound that's equal distant from another sound to like the player, the listener, but one sound you can see and the other sound you can't, if you didn't have um, an obstruction and occlusion system built, both sounds would sound the same. So if I'm looking at a sound on a hallway and if there's another sound that's like in a room to my left, um, they would both sound identical without this system. But if I had this system, and I say this system kind of generally, there are a bunch of different types of systems this can actually be. But if I had this type of system, uh, the sound in the hallway would be like very direct. It would be what you would expect from seeing it. And then the sound in the room, you would hear 
kind of echoing through the doorway and it would be much more muted and like the high ends would, would be rolled down. Um, so yeah, it's handling those sorts of things that are less immediately easy to solve problems, I guess. Um, another kind of classic example is uh, the kind of rhythm game, the Guitar Hero or Dance Dance Revolution type game. Um, an audio systems designer would probably be called on for those types of games. Uh, although there are some tools to handle this now, but in oftentimes for those types of games, you need an audio systems designer because the kind of back and forth between um, needing to synchronize things to a beat is actually a really tricky problem to solve in audio. So audio systems design is handled at various times through a development, sometimes it's handled actually before development, maybe even in pre-production as like a test to see what the game tech is actually like to see if the team can even come up with the tech that is needed for a particular idea. Um, more specific systems are often designed during the project though, um, which kind of starts to bleed into audio tools design. So audio tools design is kind of like audio systems design, but instead of creating low level systems that the game relies on. Now we're creating kind of higher level systems that the designers can use to interact with those lower level systems. So one example of this is in a project I worked on last year, um, a friend and I, an artist friend and I, and I guess another designer for a while was working or another developer as well as working with us for a while to create a beat event system to look at when beats were happening in music and look at when specific kind of events and transitions were happening in music. And then in response to those track, or I guess trigger logic for um, producing visual effects to kind of create specific behaviors and eventually create a piece of media that reacted to music. And so part of the audio tools, audio tools design was okay, we have this architecture in place. We, we know when beats are happening. We know when different marked events are happening. Um, how do we make it easy for our artists to take those kind of events and their occurrences and uh, turn that into reasonable behaviors? So creating components that could like respond to those beats and like had tunable properties. So like on beat rotate object this particular way over this amount of time using this type of a curve was like one example of something we created. Um, some studios will have their own audio tools designers. Some studios will have people that kind of hybridize that. Again, like systems, it can happen whenever. And then finally, not actually finally, but kind of finally, uh, dev studios need marketing materials. Games need to sell. If they don't sell, then uh, game devs can't stay in games, <laughs> simply speaking. Um, so with this, this is often outsourced, but it's also a bit of a group effort. And the sooner people start thinking about it, the better, because uh, essentially marketing material needs to be linear media for the most part. And because it's linear and because games, when, when games are being developed, games are not considering linear most of the time, they're considering the interactive kind of approach. Having things organized in such a way where they can be repurposed for linear media is particularly important for marketing materials. So often when a studio is involving or starts involving a marketing house or like a trailer team or something, that team will ask for kind of key assets from the game. And the audio team needs to be able to provide those assets in a way that they can use, which means they need to also have those assets organized in a way where they're easy to pass off. So like key sound effects, big explosion, big like trailer drop sound, things like that, um, that are identifiable to the game uh, need to be kind of compiled and organized and sent off to the marketing team. Um, this can happen throughout development depends on when a, team, a game is being teased and when the trailer is coming out, when it's being released, et cetera. Um, yeah.
And there are a bunch of other roles that I haven't talked about. Um, audio can get really specialized in games. Uh, I mentioned briefly the different like recording studio roles as example. That's not game specific exactly, but they are tied to things that happen in games. And there are a bunch of sort of specialists in recording studios that are definitely experts in their field. Um, oftentimes games will employ specific folks to come in and just edit raw audio files from recording sessions um, and organize those. And larger companies, as I kind of hinted at earlier, will sometimes have directors for individual departments. So like maybe they'll have an audio director, but maybe under them, they'll have a sound effects director, a music director, and a dialogue lead. Um, yeah, additionally, games are still a pretty new medium and the landscape is shifting. As an example of this, the concept of a technical sound designer, which is a sound designer that handles implementation, um, that's a role that has probably existed for less than 10 years. Um, in many places, it's existed for less than five. And still there's some, I, there's a bit of a disconnect on what the term actually of technical sound designer actually means. Um, yeah, at this point, uh, I've pretty much covered the entire talk that I had. So if there are any questions, feel free to ask them. I got one coming in. Have you ever had someone ask you to incorporate a specific sound in a project? And if so, how did you do it? Let me think about that. I don't think I have, um, at least not directly, not, not like, hey, here's a sound file, what can we do with it? I have for music in particular been asked to, been asked basically, hey, I have this like big guitar drop thing. Is there a way we could put this in the intro? And then I've had to figure out how to do that um, that's about the closest I can get to that uh, that particular example. Um, let's see. And I guess for how I did that, uh, I think I created like a riser underneath the guitar swing or guitar kind of scoop that the riser then um, was crossfaded into the actual music intro to kind of help the guitar feel like it was blending into what was actually happening. A riser is just a kind of a white noise or noise chunk that's been gated that's then um, rising up in pitch. It's that like doo type sound. Um, yeah. Do we have any other questions? What is one of the most exciting audio projects you have completed? Completed, huh? Hmm. Uh, that, that's an interesting one. I think it's gotta be Breakpoint. Um, I worked on a little twin stick shooter or twin stick slasher, I guess, which is what I showed off earlier called Breakpoint, which um, was a really fun project to work on, but it was also like a really kind of crunched not, not crunched, uh, really odd development cycle. It was a shorter development cycle. Um, but that, that project had, it was a really fun project to work on. It had a lot of interesting kind of technical challenges as well as some fun design stuff to explore. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely that one. Uh, I have some stuff that's been fun and exciting to me that isn't yet completed, but... <laughs> Some of that I can't talk about yet. Would you say it's easier for beginners in dynamic audio to learn FMOD or WISE? I'd say in general, FMOD, but okay. If you're coming from a programming background, it might be WISE because WISE is very kind of structured and logic-based. It's, it's based on the concept of logical containers and like nested logical container hierarchy. So you're dealing with a lot of like, this is a switch container. Um, you feed it a variable and it it like picks between one of whatever you have in 
depending on like what the switch input is. And this is a random container. Uh, and then you're like nesting these in the hierarchy. Whereas FMOD looks like a digital audio workstation track. Um, it looks like what a lot of people who work in music are used to looking at and then uses that kind of paradigm to then blend across to like, okay, well, we have a linear timeline with stuff that goes across it, but we can also create parameter sheets that'll trigger when the play button is hit, set if a number is met or if like a, if a certain data value is met and so on and so forth. Um, so I'd say for in general, it's FMOD, but with the caveat that programmers tend to have a little more of an intuitive grasp for whys. What I will say is if you want to work in indie, learn FMOD. Or actually, if you want to work in indie, do either. If you want to work at a AAA studio, learn whys. Um, are entry level sound design jobs common? If not, what positions help really well towards that career? Uh, if you could follow up on what you mean by positions, I'd be curious. Entry level sound design jobs are fairly common. However, entry level sound design is possibly the most competitive space in game dev. So those jobs are very hard to get, like specifically the entry level ones. Um, there are a ton of people trying to get those jobs. Uh, what positions help really well towards that? If you're curious about like what to do if you really wanted to become an entry level sound designer, I'd say work on sound design first and foremost, right? To make sure that you can actually do the sound design that you want. Um, next, try to figure out, try to like work on stuff that pertains to games. So do some game jams, learn a little bit of implementation at least. Um, and then third is network, make friends in the industry, network, go to a bunch of different events. Um, if you're comfortable with it, I highly recommend like posting work in progress on social media as much as possible. Just like talking to people in the field. Um, those are really the, the keys to getting any kind of job I found, but in particular, uh, for sound design, those are super important. Uh, common misconceptions in your field. Hmm. That's hard. That's that's really hard. I think one misconception coming in is surrounding what networking is um, and like how important it is. Because networking honestly is everything in terms of getting work in this field, um, particularly on the design side, but just in general. And all that network re networking really is is like making friends, um, making friends with people, and like staying in touch with people and like sharing. I guess, conversations and ideas with people. So that's one big thing. Uh, I'd say another thing is there are a lot of folks that I feel like under undervalue the importance of audio implementation. And this is maybe a little selfish of me to say, because that's what I do. Um, but I do feel like there's a lot of room for games to kind of refine their presentation through audio implementation and a lot of value that can be gained for like fairly low effort in that space. So that's another sort of misconception. Um, not sure if that answers the question. If, if you have a particular thing you're curious about, feel free to forward it uh, again or ask the extension of that. How do you think about the career growth potential of the game audio tech role? very limited to some companies or a lot of opportunities in the future. Um, particularly on the programming side, I think there's a ton of potential. I think there are, especially in the AAA space, that's a very rare skill set. Like tech audio, not a whole lot of people do that. And it's pretty sought after in the AAA space. On smaller, two, stu, uh, sorry, smaller studios, it's a really hard sell because it's such a specialized thing and a lot of smaller studios just simply don't have the budget for somebody to be that specialized. However, if somebody does tech audio and say like UI design or something like that, um, or they do tech audio 
and music production, that's a much easier sell. But again, um, in terms of potential, I think there's a lot like career growth potential, particularly again on the programming side. If you start getting into the point where you're doing like engine architecture and stuff, like that's a pretty rare skill set with a fair amount of value. Cool. I think that's about it. And it looks like we're pretty much out of time now too. Uh, thank you all for coming out to my talk. If you have any questions for me additionally, like beyond what was asked today, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I think my LinkedIn is going to be provided. You can also reach out to me on social media. I'm perfectly happy to answer stuff on like Twitter or wherever. My handle is in the bottom right hand corner here. It's at Colin V audio. Um, so yeah, that, thank you all for coming out. Yes, right, so thank you so much. Go ahead, Erica. Go ahead. I was just gonna say um, thank you so much for coming back for a second year in a row. Um, it's really awesome. You gave so much insight and knowledge to, to our student audience, and we just really appreciate you being here. Um, anything you want to add? Not that I can think of. Um, I guess. Yeah, this, this was a really dense talk. And so if anyone's feeling intimidated by just like the amount of stuff I just threw at you, uh, feel free to go back and rewatch it. Um, and again, yeah, shoot me questions. Uh, not everything I said here is like from an expert's perspective. Like I know some of this stuff and the rest of this stuff is like secondhand. So feel free to like question it and research it deeper. But um, I do think from a high level, this is a pretty solid overview of like the general idea of what game audio looks like. So yeah, that's all. Thank you for having yeah. me. Yeah. Just so everyone knows, uh, his LinkedIn will be in the description for the event on the lab's website. So just so everyone knows. And thank you again, Colin. We really appreciate it on behalf of everyone at labs. Thank, thank you. you for having me. Thanks for thank showing you. up, everyone. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye, everybody.